For many years, Crewe has been renowned as a centre of engineering excellence. Less than a quarter of a mile from the home of the world-famous Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars lies the Crewe Locomotive Works, which over 150 years has produced railway locomotives which have themselves become synonymous with railway engineering excellence. Today, the site of Crewe Locomotive Works is owned and operated by ABB Daimler Benz Transportation Limited under the banner of ADTRANS. Watching over the main entrance is one of the famous Eagles, placed there following the demolition of Eagle Bridge, situated at the eastern end of the works. ADTRANS was established on the 1st of January 1996 by a merger of the respective railway activities of Swedish-Swiss ABB Asia Brown Bovary and Daimler Benz AG. In addition to the historic works at Crewe, ADTRANS also operate locomotive works at Derby, Doncaster, Swindon and nine other locations throughout the British Isles. The green dot of the ADTRANS logo represents a green light, indicating clear, brakes off, go ahead. The classic image of crew locomotive works with a locomotive body slung under the overhead cranes in time-honoured fashion. These images of a princess coronation class being built in 1935 symbolise what to many was the golden era of steam locomotive construction at Crewe. LMS number 6207, Princess Arthur of Connaught, was built as lot number 120 for heavy express duties on the West Coast Main Line. One of the most amazing sights is the way heavy loads are slung about in the works. All manner of smaller parts are made in the smithy. Nuts and bolts in all sizes and varieties, rivets for the tens of thousands. The main frames, which may be called the foundations of the engine, arrive in the form of flat steel plates. The lack of safety precautions and the Victorian working conditions are almost unimaginable today but this was all accepted as part of everyday life in the years before the Second World War. These fascinating scenes were captured by the LMS film unit for publicity purposes, which explains why the engine had been painted prior to being fully completed. The scale of activity within the erecting shop forms an impressive background as the Pacific's crank axle is placed in position. 6207 is now ready for wheeling. Actually, the engine is placed on the wheels and not the wheels on the engine. Two 50-ton cranes lift 6207 and move her to a position over the wheel. The three driving wheels are fitted first. The four leading bogies and two trailing wheels will come later. The locomotive superstructure is delicately lowered onto its three main driving axles. 
Once the valve gear is in place and pony wheels attached, the locomotive is drawn out into the yard, ready to receive its tender. Latest of her class, pride of the line and pride of the men who built her. Over 90 years of experience has gone to her making. For it was in 1843 that works were first established at Crewe. Dead and lifeless as yet, steel hawsers draw her slowly into the ocean. 6207 is an engine worth being proud of. An engine you can boast about with safety. Soon she will be rushing over the main lines at 80 miles an hour. In the years prior to the formation of the LMS in 1923, the London and North Western Railway Company constructed a wide variety of locomotive types of crew, becoming famous for its extensive use of prefabricated components. From the impressive lines of Bowen Cook's four-cylinder Clawton, built in 1913, and the earlier precursor class 440s, all crew built products had a functional appearance. Unlike many other pre-grouping companies who adopted cosmetic adornments and bright color schemes, the crew decreed that all its engines be finished in somber black. But in deference to its patrons, passenger locomotives were painted in lined black. Sadly, few of the LNWR designs survived after nationalization, although three locomotives have been preserved in the national collection. Arguably, the most famous design to emerge from crew was Stania's mixed-traffic Black 5, so named after its color and power rating. 842 of these locomotives were put into service between the years 1934 and 1951. More powerful 460 designs, such as this rebuilt Patriot and the Jubilee class, were built at crew and were the backbone of the LMS Express engine fleet. Nationalization amongst the standard types built at crew were the Britannia Pacifics. These proved to be a great success in contrast to the more powerful but unique Duke of Gloucester. Withdrawn in 1962, it was rescued from Barry Scrapyard in 1972, and after a pioneering rebuild, has proved to be an outstanding locomotive. However, the most famous steam locomotives built at Crewe were undoubtedly the Duchess Pacifics, which dominated the heaviest of the West Coast mainline services for almost 25 years. These 165-ton locomotives were Stania's ultimate Pacific design. One of these engines, Duchess of Gloucester, had the honor of having attained the highest power output ever recorded with steam in a dynamometer car test in Great Britain. to the LNER streamlined A4s, the LMS constructed the first Pacifics with a streamlined casing, which although hampering routine maintenance, resulted in one of the most impressive and attractive looking machines ever to emerge from crew. Following the end of steam construction in 1947, crew turned its attention to diesel and electric locomotive designs. Almost the equivalent of the Black Five, the brush type 4, later designated the class 47, has proved to be an outstanding success. 44 of the 74 strong diesel hydraulic class 52s were built at crew in 1962 and 63. Affectionately known as Westerns, they were allocated entirely to the former Western region of British Rail. By February 1977, the last surviving members of the class had been withdrawn. Class 87s were the first mainline electric class to be built at crew. 
36 of these locos were built in 1977 and 78 for West Coast mainline duties. The most spectacular failure to emerge from crew was the tilting advanced passenger train seen here at Oxenholm. Despite extensive trials, problems with the tilting system could not be overcome and the project was cancelled. One of the prototype sets can still be seen at the Railway Age crew. In stark contrast, the HSTs, later designated Class 43, built at crew between 1976 and 1982, have proved to be an outstanding success, and until the early 90s, with the advent of widespread electrification, have been the mainstay of express workings throughout the British Railways network. In 1989 and 90, the Class 90 and 91s were the last of the mainline electric locomotives to emerge from crew. In addition to building locomotives, Crew Works has also been responsible for maintenance work and for breaking up obsolete designs. At the end of steam, many crew designs returned to their place of birth to face the cutter's torch, and in a matter of days were reduced to a pile of scrap. Awaiting their fate within the works are classes 08, 37 and 47, although in many cases components will be recovered and refurbished for further use. This DMU had been on loan to the police for training purposes. Class 90 and attendant coach in this view were definitely not for cutting up, having arrived to participate in the works open day. In its heyday, Crew Works employed over 20,000 people and had its own foundries, forges and machine shops. This allowed in-house production of almost all the necessary components required for the maintenance and construction of the LMS locomotive fleet. With the elimination of steam and the requirement for fewer locomotives, many of the buildings which echoed to the sound of heavy engineering have now been demolished or stand idle. Vivid reminders of crew's industrial heritage are still to be found within the operational areas of the works. As the millennium approaches, Webb and Bowen Cook would have been impressed with the work now being performed by Adtrans in the very same workshops that saw the birth of their own designs. Although some of the structural elements of the works date from the 19th century, heavy investment in modernizing the buildings has resulted in a working environment suited to the 90s. Rather than returning complete locomotives for overhaul, 
cost-conscious train operators are increasingly returning component parts for servicing. This power unit from a class 37 has been returned as an exchange unit and the unit will be completely dismantled and components suitable for overhaul will be retained. This procedure allows the operator to retain their locomotives in revenue earning service which in turn decreases the need for large locomotive fleets. The first stage in the refurbishing program is for the unit to be broken down to its component parts, with parts likely to be required being placed in storage. Parts destined for overhaul are thoroughly cleaned and degreased. Cylinder blocks are thoroughly inspected for flaws and the cylinder liners, having been machined, are deglazed. Meanwhile, the valve seats of the cylinder heads are accurately machined. The progress of parts is logged through the system with final finishing of the camshaft being carried out by hand. New camshaft bushes are inserted in the cylinder block and the cylinder head studs are individually tested for flaws with an ultrasonic scanner.
Following installation of the camshafts, the crankshaft, new pistons, connecting rods and cylinder heads are fitted. Turbochargers receive attention in their own designated area and the whole assembly comes together as a complete power unit ready for testing. These completed engines will either be held for stock or exchanged for units awaiting service. Some of these power units are actually destined for naval warships. Another example of AdTrans's flexibility and ability to offer their services to a wide range of customers. The electrical repair shop concerns itself with a range of services for the refurbishment of large motors and generating sets through to microelectronics. Incoming units are stripped and checked, with field coils and armatures being rewound and replaced as required. This work is highly skilled and labor intensive, with insulation being wound by hand and each winding being carefully fitted into place. is taken to ensure that the armature shafts are correctly balanced to avoid vibration and extend their life in service. After rebuilding the generator, the excess material on the commutator is removed. Microelectronics play an increasing role in locomotive components, and ad transit facilities provide for the inspection of PC boards and the diagnosis of faults on microchip circuitry. Adtrans offers a complete overhaul and rebuild service for bogies, with many locomotive operators exchanging bogies due for overhaul for rebuilt units as dictated by maintenance schedules.
Adtrans are proud to have one of the finest bogey repair centres in Europe. The main workload consists of the overhaul of locomotive bogies at their two and four year repair cycle. Bogies received in for overhaul are first cleaned and stripped with wheel sets and traction motors being dispatched for repair elsewhere. Within these acoustic welding booths, bogies receive a variety of welding and plating processes before progressing to the main workshop area. As bogies pass through the length of the repair shop, a sophisticated assembly line system ensures that bogies are completed by the time they reach the end of the repair area. The braking components, springs, dampers and other ancillary parts are overhauled in-house and returned to as-new condition. Frames are ultrasonically tested and any flaws discovered are repaired in accordance with established procedures. All the components then come together and are rebuilt into the complete bogey, returning it to first-class condition. In addition to traction bogies, Adtrans also refurbishes rolling stock bogies. These class 43 and 37 bogies have reached their final build stage. Also in the process of being repaired is this collision-damaged Class 165 bogey. <laughs> Refurbished Class 37 bogies receive their brake gear as several other Class 37 axles await installation. As these class 37 axles await installation, technicians complete final checks on a rail part owned class 43 bogey. The Adtrans Vehicle Repair Division specializes in freight rolling stock maintenance. Adtrans currently has numerous wagon maintenance contracts for companies such as Shell UK, Esso, NACO and others. These fuel tankers have been completely refurbished on behalf of their owners Shell UK Limited. As if to underline the flexibility of the range of services offered by Adtrans, this chain drive MOD two foot gauge 040 had been completely overhauled. The high degree of finish is a credit to the team of engineers who worked on the loco. This Bagley Drury four-cylinder chain-driven diesel mechanical locomotive is an example of a type which spend their working lives within one of the MOD's ordnance depots. This particular example being from the north of England.
The Napier Deltic engine, originally designed for naval purposes, became a household name on being fitted to the famous English Electric Class 55 Deltic locomotives. Also originating from the English Electric stable was the Class 37, which for many years has been the backbone of the British mainline diesel fleet. This particular Class 37 locomotive is undergoing a routine overhaul and repaint. Still bearing the outdated BR Double Arrow logo, Class 08, number 08911, awaits the return of its wheels and motion following their overhaul. RES liveried 47771 has its roof removed to gain access to its generator bay for a main generator change. Entering traffic in 1966 as D1946, it was renumbered 47503, in addition to being named the Geordie for several years. Forty-seven eight oh five was scheduled to return to traffic when the stringent pre-delivery inspection revealed a fault in the locomotive generator. Ad Trans engineers immediately commenced operations to separate and remove the generator for further testing. In contrast to modern electrical designs, the 47's complex cabling and wiring arrangements are indicative of the technology of the time. It's standard practice for locomotives to be removed from their bogies during their full major overhaul. And this poses no problems to the two overhead cranes, each with a capacity of 40 tons.
This view of the underside of 47805 reveals the complexity of the hydraulic, air and electrical pipework which runs beneath the loco's body. Forty-seven eight oh five was originally numbered D1935 when constructed in March 1966. At one period, it bore the name Bristol Bath Road, and after the installation of long-range fuel tanks, the loco was renumbered from 47257 to its present number. Supporting frames dedicated to specific classes are kept on hand and once engaged with the loco body provide a stable and reliable base from which engineering staff can carry out the necessary work on the locomotive. Over in the adjacent bay, 37425 Concrete Bob stands beneath a section of roof currently being renewed. Built in July 1965, the loco was named in 1986 after Sir Robert McAlpine.
2187 Sir Charles Wheatstone started life at English Electric's Vulcan foundry at nearby Newton the Willows in January 1967. These 1,000 horsepower Bobo locomotives were originally introduced in 1957 and the basic soundness of their design has ensured their longevity. The striking EWS livery is shown to good effect on a class 08 which has received a full general overhaul. The Centro liveried Midlands based class 156 unit is receiving modifications to its fire suppression system. Body repairs of a more fundamental nature are being carried out to this Western Region HST power car following accidental damage. A complete new GRP molded cab unit has been installed and awaits its internal fitments. This view of a second cab clearly shows its method of attachment to the rest of the power car's superstructure. The large opening will allow access to the engine compartment. Almost 200 of these Class 43 HST power cars were built at Crewe between 1976 and 1982. They've operated with great success throughout the British Rail network and have been displaced only with the onset of large-scale electrification works. Engines which have been removed from their locomotives are extensively tested on AdTrans's sophisticated engine test and diagnostic equipment. All aspects of the engine's performance are monitored via cables linked to the adjacent soundproofed operation booth, which enables AdTrans technicians to fully check the engine's operation. This engine is a Paxman Valenta RP200, a type used in Class 43 units developing a mighty 2,755 horsepower. Closed circuit television and a myriad of different monitoring instruments enable the technicians to test engines under a wide variety of simulated operating conditions. Following refitting of the engine and generator, locomotives are moved on to the outside diesel test area. Here the electrical performance of a power unit can be monitored under simulated operational conditions. Varying resistance load can be imposed on the electrical circuitry the heat energy thus created being dissipated through a large cooling tank. The test bay can accommodate two locomotives at any one time and technicians monitor all aspects of the generator's output from within a heavily soundproofed office. As you might expect, the noise produced in this area could be a nuisance to neighboring properties, so sound absorbing barriers have also been placed around the area. With many locomotives having to be moved without their own power, a Class 08 has become one of the latest in a long line of crew work shunters. 
All the access and storage roads within the depot are linked by means of a centrally positioned traversa. Being almost 25 metres in length, the traversa allows both the 08 and the mainline diesel loco to be moved at the same time as well as allowing locomotives to be easily moved between work areas without the need for complex shunting operations, the Traversa also saves space by eliminating the need for a complex array of points. The electrically powered traverser can be controlled from small cabins at each end of the deck. Alignment of the deck is fully automatic. The apparent mixed colour scheme of the 08 is due to the application of primer prior to the locomotive receiving its own ad trans livery. As well as the 08, ADTRANS also possess a more unusual shunter in the form of this mini-lock road rail vehicle. Its eight rubber-tired driving wheels provide adequate traction on both road and rail surfaces to allow it to handle the heaviest of loads. Small flanged pilot wheels provide the rail guidance which would otherwise be performed by flanged driving wheels. The Herculean abilities of this minuscule diesel-powered locomotive are amply demonstrated as she moves class 45041 into position. This and other locomotives have arrived at Crewe as part of a display of preserved locomotives, which were to form one of the attractions of the Open Day to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the formation of the London and North Western Railway. Despite being a multinational company, ADTRANS is well aware that the history of the locomotive works at Crewe is inextricably linked with the development of the local community. The locality has a strong tradition of raising money for charity, and with the full support of ABB directors, ADTRANS's crew personnel had thrown themselves wholeheartedly into the task of open day preparations. ADTRANS welcomed the opportunity to host the 150th anniversary celebrations in conjunction with the members of the LNWR and LMS societies. As the week preceding the open day progressed, the emphasis switched from normal day-to-day -day operations to the complex logistical problems involved in accommodating a number of visiting diesel and steam locomotives. Another open day arrival is D1041 Western Prince, built at Crewe in October 1962. Western Prince was one of the last of the class to be withdrawn from active service in February 1977. The Western region's dieselization policy centered on diesel hydraulic designs of which the warships were arguably the most successful. Attractively restored in BR Maroon livery, Western Prince is normally based at the East Lanx Railway.
used extensively on the preserved railway, these archive scenes from 1964 show the locomotive in its natural environment of the former Great Western Main Line at Dawlish Warren. Among the steam locomotives visiting for the open day was BR Standard Class 7P Britannia and the unique Class 8P Duke of Gloucester, both crew-built products. The proud British tradition of naming locomotives has its own followers with many famous nameplates now in private ownership. One of the main attractions of the Crew Open Day was the largest gathering of railway locomotive nameplates and memorabilia ever to be seen outside a formal museum setting. Collectors had come from far and wide to bring their prized exhibits for public display. That's pretty. Snuff box. And we don't know what that is. We think it's an apprentice's lamp, but nobody knows. A leading expert on the subject and organizer of the country's largest auctions of railway honor, Ian Wright, takes up the story. Well, this is the first and last time that such a magnificent display of nameplates and other memorabilia will be ever on public display. Uh, there's something over 200 original nameplates from crew-built crew locomotives and other items of memorabilia from the London and North Western Railway and the London Midland and Scottish Railway that was based here at Crew, of course. Mm. Um, through my contacts, uh, I've been able to, uh, being a collector myself for 30 years, I've been able to ring around everybody who I know owns nameplates and other items, and they've kindly agreed to bring them all to crew for this superb and historic exhibition. Really, the nameplates have no value, except, of course, if you come to sell them. Uh, and, of course, most of them will never be sold. They'll just be handed down through families and so on. But I suppose in monetary terms, there's probably over a million pounds if, if they were sold. Well, everything's interesting. Uh, we, we're very privileged to have both nameplates off the London and North Western Railway Coronation class with, with the Crown, and both nameplates from the London Middle and Scottish Railway Coronation with the Crown. We've got both nameplates off the ill-fated Princess Anne, you know, that was destroyed in the Harrow and Wheelstone crash. Uh, we've got a nameplate from the only Royal Scot class built at Crewe, which is British Legion. Uh, we've got a Britannia class locomotive nameplate, Jubilee class, Patriots, Clans, so magnificent. Plus a major display of artifacts based on from people's, five people's uh, individual collections. And the nameplates really are, are obtained by people because of what they remember from the steam era and it may, they may have a nameplate because it pulled the honeymoon train or it was the first engine they ever saw or you know they had a footplate around it, on it or something. There's usually some reason why people collect individual nameplates. And of course we've got steam here and diesels because diesels were built at Crew as well, of course. And they're, in some ways, are more interest to the modern era, you know. In 1954, with the future of steam in doubt, it was surprising when a new BR class 8P was constructed at Crewe. Intended as a forerunner of a complete new class of Pacifics, no further construction was sanctioned and Duke of Gloucester was destined to be the sole example of this type. The locomotive was never regarded as successful and was withdrawn in 1962. In 1966, it was sent to Wooden Scrapyard where it stayed until being rescued in 1972. Following a 16-year restoration program, the condition of the locomotive bears testimony to the dedicated professionalism, care and attention that have been lavished on this engine.
The abutments of the dismantled Eagle Bridge straddle the entry road to crew works. The site of the former scrapping line was used to coal up the engines in readiness for the open day. Apart from Duke of Gloucester, the other engines were in light steam in order to ensure that their lubrication systems worked effectively. The smallest steam loco present was this Class 2 MT, built at Crewe in 1950. Anniversary open day and all that it represented had caused intense media interest. So much so that Sky TV had sent a team to cover the occasion. Perhaps not surprisingly, a member of the Duke of Gloucester's support crew had been singled out for interview. Whilst most of the steam locos present had a full volunteer backup team to ensure that they looked their best for the occasion, Duchess of Hamilton was relying on the efforts of a small team under one of the NRM senior engineers. Ray, is this just another day's work for you, or is there an element of pleasure in bringing the Duchess to a, a weekend like this? Well, to some extent, it's all, uh, all in a day's work, but there is a great deal uh, of pleasure in bringing an engine back to its birthplace. Uh, to crew works um, to be part of the celebrations tomorrow on the 17th of August. Right, right. Duchess has been up at Carlisle, I understand, with a bit of a problem there uh, getting her down here. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I mean, the, en the engine was brought uh, through to crew, dragged through to crew in light steam uh, with a Trans Rail Class 37 earlier this week um, because of a uh, rail track fire ban. Um, and we've been trapped up there, oh, possibly about Two, two months or so, lost an awful lot of work, mainline work, because of the dry weather. And where is she bound to after this weekend? She'll go back from the works to the Heritage Centre. The next work is in October and November, working from the Heritage Centre. Then, of course, um, she comes out of mainline certificate uh, in early December this year. Well, quite a bit of preparation already, and I imagine you have a lot more to do. Are you working on your own here this afternoon? Yes, yes, I had an assistant all arranged to come, uh, but I think he's got problems at home, and so uh, I find myself all alone. But never mind, we've got plenty of time to get her ready. Well, I, lit, I lit her up this afternoon, and she's getting warm, and uh, mm -hmm. she'll be smoking away for the uh, festivities tomorrow. So just going to sit there in steam during the open day? That's it. Been light steam. Hopefully uh, people will be visiting the foot plate and generally enjoying the day. Right. You've a lot to do. We'd better let you get on with it, I think. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Ray. With all of the engines cold up and ready to go, Duke of Gloucester had the honour of leading this impressive cavalcade back to the main works end. Go 
hold in, you all. The main line from Crewe to Chester runs alongside the works, with the name of the adjacent signal box reflecting Crewe's industrial past. There was much still to do as the engines were positioned ready for the open day. The last class of express passenger locomotives to be built in Britain, the Britannias were also the last to remain in service. Number 70,000 Britannia was completed at Crewe in 1950 and was withdrawn in 1966. Unlike the other surviving member of the class, 70013 Oliver Cromwell, Britannia has been restored to full mainline running order. While some teams could take a well-earned break, for most members of the Stania 8F support team, it was time for hard graft. Although, more pressing matters had obviously diverted the attention of one member of the team. Saturday, the 17th of August, and AdTrans's expectations had been fulfilled, with many people taking this opportunity to visit this historic location and its locomotives. With a variety of trade stands, every possible requirement of the visiting enthusiast was catered for, and their questions answered by enthusiastic experts.
In the August sun, it was soon time for refreshment and time to reflect on the scene. But for some, it was all too much. For others, a visit to a locomotive footplate was a memorable occasion, something to tell mum about when they returned home. A sense of occasion was added to the proceedings when this Class 45 was rededicated and named Royal Tank Regiment. Built in June 1962 as D-53, the locomotive had carried this name since September 1964, but had never participated in an official naming ceremony. Named the Royal Tank Regiment to the purpose of restoration and the pleasure of all those who will be associated with its future activities. Veterans and current service members of the Royal Tank Regiment formed a guard of honour and added their contribution to the occasion. Inside the former stores building, an impressive display of models depicting the LMS and LNWR heritage provided an interesting attraction to visitors of all ages. Although steam engines are obviously no longer built at crew, the modeler's craft parallels the locomotive building skills that made the LNWR the premier line. Alas, these engines are no more, but a tangible reminder of former glories remains in the form of the magnificent display of nameplates which came to be known as the Crew Wall. This memorable scene brings to an end our visit to the historic Crew Works, a centre of excellence over the years now safe in the hands of Adtrans.